Okay. There we go. Cool. Hi, everyone. Uh, so it's it's becoming increasingly important to to be able to read and interpret uh, different kinds of statistical graphs. Uh, you may also know that as data visualization. Um, there are a bunch of different types. There are some range from being very simple to uh, being very complex and incorporating a lot of uh, different uh, information about the data. Uh, so first, I want to talk about like what data visualization really is about. Uh, it, it's about storytelling. You're, you're telling a story about the data and uh, there are different goals uh, when you're visualizing something, you're going to want to avoid the data, distorting the data, and you want to present, uh, you know, a large data set in a small space um, because, you know, you could just show the raw data or you could summarize it in a in a visualization that uh, people have a, you know, people are very visual uh, beings and uh, have an intuition for interpreting like visual patterns. Uh, there are t different types uh, of variables that can be visualized. Uh, there are continuous variables uh, that usually have like a that have a numeric um, value. So th things like time, age, weight, lengths, uh, like height, distance, time spent online, drug dosage. Um, those are continuous variables, and theoretically, they have you know uh, an infinite range of possible values. But in in reality, sometimes uh, you're you're only limited to a, a certain subset. Uh, so, for example, somebody cannot be infinite uh, years old. Uh, then there are categorical variables. Uh, sometimes you can you will see them referred to as discrete or qualitative, uh, and then within that uh, broad category, you have two subcategories uh, that are nominal variables, which are uh, w which is what you probably see the most, and then there's ordinal variables uh, that are uh, categorical variables that have a ranking. So uh, if you're, uh, you've probably encountered like the Likert rating scale, uh, which is where, you know, so you either strongly disagree with something or strongly agree with something. Um, and then you can be somewhere in between uh, that particular scale. Uh, so when you're looking at uh, a particular visualization, uh, one of the things that you're looking for is uh, trying to identify what type of variable is being presented to you, uh, whether it's a categorical variable or whether it's a continuous variable, or maybe there are multiple variables being shown to you, and uh, what you're actually getting is a story being told about uh, a possible relationships that those variables can have. Um, so there are core features of uh, statistical graphs that you should always look out for, and these are uh, the title, uh, so most plots will have this, uh, and that's usually like your first uh, go-to point for figuring out uh, what exactly you're being shown. Uh, then there are axis labels, um, if the if the type of plot has axes, um, and all, all plots, I think, uh, almost all plots should have this, uh, because uh, that is such a crucial way for uh, the reader um, for the, for the audience to understand what exactly is being visualized. Uh, then, I, like I mentioned before, you're looking at the types of variables uh, being visualized. Uh, usually, if you're uh, looking at a, a plot that has an x-axis and a y-axis, uh, the independent variable, which is sometimes called the predictor, um, that's going to go on the x-axis uh, in, in most cases. In fact, when you're dealing with time, uh, it is uh, very important for the uh, x for the time to be on the x-axis because we're used to thinking of of time uh, like linearly and in a uh, in a horizontal fashion rather than a vertical one. Um, on the vertical, you're going on the vertical, which is the y-axis. You're going to have the uh, outcome variable, also sometimes called the response or the dependent variable. Uh, so usually, that's uh, like knowing these two things. Uh, will help you uh, if you're if you encounter like a, a particularly complex uh, st statistical graph um, this will help you like get started in trying to interpret it and, and read it and get what it's trying to say uh, another thing to be on the lookout for uh, are the scales so 
certain graphs will have uh, linear scales that uh, look, you know, the way that uh, that you expect them to. Uh, but then sometimes uh, peop the author of the of the graph will transform the scale uh, using like a log transformation or or the square root uh, or another uh, transformation, and that's to uh, as you will see later on in this presentation, that's that's to help with uh, like data that's maybe skewed uh, in in a particular direction, and so it's it's a way to um, make it look a little bit more interpretable um, and and help you see the patterns better. Uh, so the rest of this presentation presentation will focus on common data visualizations. Uh, some are more common than others. I will start with uh, some of the more simpler ones, and then. Uh, kind of build up from there into more complex ones. Uh, right now, are there? Do, does anyone have any questions uh, that they like to ask? No. Um, yeah. So f feel free to, like, at any point, uh, type a question into the chat, and then I will read out the question and, and try to answer it uh, as best as I can. Okay. Let's start with a uh, pie chart. Uh, a pie chart is uh, one of the more prevalent uh, types of statistical graphs. I don't think it's uh, it's a very good one, but it's something that a lot of you probably encounter a lot uh, on a, on a daily basis. Um, it it actually works really well when you have a certain number of categories that you're trying to visualize. Um, uh, so it's so first of all, it's for visualizing categorical variables. Uh, and like amounts of them. Uh, it works great when you have less than five categories that you're trying to visualize, uh, because then after that, it becomes really hard to compare the uh, different like slices of a pie chart. Uh, and then there's the bar plot for situations when you have uh, more than four categories that you're trying to visualize. Uh, and both of these are ways to visualize uh, data that, that can also be presented in a table, uh, such as what you can see here in the uh, upper left. Uh, so these are, all three of these are totally valid representations of the same data set. Uh, and like I said, bar plot is going to start to become more important uh, the more categories you have. Uh, the way to read a bar plot is you uh, you're comparing different groups uh, by looking at the height of the bars. So the height is, um, you can you can get uh, the height from looking at the y-axis and seeing uh, where where the bar stops. And yep, that's, uh, it, this is, yeah, these are the more, more common ones and, and very simple. Uh, so a bar plot uh, can sometimes be augmented with error bars. Uh, this is useful. This is uh, especially true when you're dealing with uh, with random samples rather than like all of the possible data, uh, or all the possible uh, uh, observations uh, they can have. So, uh, kind of building up from the previous slide where we had all the counties in United States, uh, here I took a random sample, uh, like just. 25% of the counties, uh, and then also made a bar plot. But because I'm not using all the available data uh, of like about all the possible counties, I'm just using a random sample, that means that the uh, proportions that I get are actually like approximations. Uh, and when you're approximating something, it's going to have uh, some some margin of error. And so a, uh, an error bar is a way to represent that uncertainty. So if you encounter a bar plot with error bars, uh, that's that's to show you uh, a particular uncertainty the author has about uh, like the height of the bar. Oh, also uh, it varies. So some authors use like plus minus one standard error for the for the error bars. In this particular case, I decided to use a ninety five percent confidence interval. But the distinction between those is outside the scope of this presentation. Uh, moving on, uh, a histogram can be considered as a uh, as a bar plot where you're uh, you have a continuous variable and then you bin 
that continuous variable into a bunch of a bunch of smaller like categories uh, that indicate like a particular range. So we have you know the height of black cherry trees, and then we decide to uh, create categories. So we're going to say, okay, uh, the first category is going to be uh, between 60 and 65. Uh, feet, and then the second category is going to be between 65 and 70 feet, and then you get a bar plot from that that is called a histogram when you use it on a continuous variable, and that is a way to see a continuous variable's distribution. Uh, things to watch out for are the the size of the bins that you use in a histogram, or that the author used in the histogram, uh, because uh, like larger bins will make the um, make the histogram uh, more like more general. It'll it'll make it more uh, make it smoother, and maybe obscure some of the some of the possible like local maximums, local minimums. Uh, so usually the author of the histogram will take a, a lot of care in figuring out the uh, the right size of the bins to use to show the distribution uh, but not to, but not to make it too too coarse or too smooth uh, another way to uh, look at a distribution of a continuous variable is to also use a density uh, in the example on the right uh, i took a histogram and then i uh, converted it from being a count of observations to instead being a, a density so a probability density um, and then overlaid a, uh, a density. So that is a smooth version of the histogram. Uh, and these are both ways to look at a distribution of a continuous variable. You can also use density plots to compare different distributions across multiple groups. Uh, so in, the, in this particular data set, uh, which is uh, iris flowers, we're looking at how uh, sepal length uh, is diff the distribution of sepal length varies across the different species. Uh, so in the density plot, you know, you can easily see that, oh, the, uh, the bulk of the setosa species is uh, around five centimeters. Um, and then the bulk of the uh, versicolor species, for example, is uh, like around six centimeters. Another way to uh, look at Another way to compare the distributions is also to use a box and whiskers plot. Uh, people call them box plots also. Uh, and a box plot is, it can be useful for comparing the, the groups in a, in a very broad way. Uh, but I personally don't think it, uh, they're very useful because they're not, they don't show you the distribution so well. They just show you uh, some, of the, some of the highlights. Uh, for example, it shows you the range shows you possible outliers uh, using a very particular rule. Uh, so if, if, somebody is curious, if somebody is curious about what rule is used to actually determine a possible outlier, I can uh, you know, let you know after the, after the talk. Then there's uh, the median. Uh, and so you're looking at different quartiles when you use a bo uh, box plot. It's not great, but it can actually be very useful when you're combining it with uh, a violin plot. A uh, violin plot is uh, basically if you took the density plot that I was showing earlier and kind of s spread them out, uh, you would get a violin plot. It is uh, a density plot, but like flipped, and it's a way to uh, look at the distributions uh, so that they are not overlapping like they were in the density plot before. Uh, and then... Some, you can even encounter com uh, situations where the violin plot has been augmented with a box plot. Uh, and at that point, it's actually a very useful uh, visualization because one, you're getting uh, a, a much better look of the distribution, uh, but then you're also getting some of the, uh, some of the highlights about it. So you know, where the median is, uh, possible outliers, uh, what the range is, what the, um, like what the middle 50% of the distribution look look like uh, because in the box plot, that's actually what the uh, the box represents. It represents the uh, middle 50% of the of the values. 
Any questions so far? Uh, keep remember that at any point you you are welcome to ask questions if you want something clarified uh, if I'm not being clear uh, and I will uh, happily answer them okay so we previously we were looking at a relationship between a categorical variable and a continuous variable categorical variable being the uh, species and then the continuous variable being the sepal length uh, oh whoa what is going on Okay, uh, a scatter plot is uh, is a way to visualize the relationship between two continuous variables. So, uh, on on the x-axis we're going to have the tree diameter in inches, and then on the y-axis we're going to have the volume of the black cherry tree in cubic feet. As we can see, there is a linear relationship between those two variables, um, because in the calculation of the volume of the cherry tree, you're actually using the tree diameter. Uh, you can also, like, you, you can also uh, color and change the shape of the of the points on the scatter plot according to other variables, uh, such as the such as in the example that we have on the right, uh, where we have a scatter plot, and the points have been colored and uh, shaped differently according to which species they belong to. So if we're looking at sepal length and then petal length, uh, we can see how those different species uh, you know, are, are different between each other. Okay, uh, as I mentioned before, sometimes the author can scale the, uh, the axes uh, to maybe tell a better story, tell a more clear, tell a clearer story. Um, so let's take a look at a case where we have um, the response variable y that is very right, that is uh, positively skewed, um, and how it makes it uh, makes it better for like if if you're doing a linear relationship between the variables, uh, if you were to apply like a log transform uh, transformation to the variable, and then suddenly we go from uh, if you look at the bottom left uh, scatter plot. We go from something that doesn't have a linear relationship and uh, uh, looks like it might be uh, exponential to a linear relationship on the bottom right uh, as a result of the transformation. Uh, at that point, it is very important to notice the uh, the axis label. So on the y-axis label, we have a, that like it's telling us that oh, this is a uh, log transformed axis as opposed to a just a, a raw axis like we were seeing before so these are things to watch out for uh, usually you won't encounter a scatter plot matrix uh, usually this is something that uh, a data analyst would do when they're uh, exploring a data set and exploring different relationships uh, between the variables so this is a way to get a very very like broad overview of possible uh, linear or, or nonlinear relationships between variables. So, uh, for example, uh, we can see that there is a, uh, is a, a suggestion of a linear relationship between the miles per gallon of a car and the weight of the car. Uh, so that's something that if a, if data analyst is looking at the scatter plot, they will they would notice that and then explore that relationship and see how the weight of the car affects the miles per gallon that the car has. Uh, a time series plot is a type of scatter plot. Uh, specifically, it's a, it's a scatter plot where the x-axis is time. And uh, it, it's also because the observations are linked together uh, over time, uh, the author of the graph will also add a line uh, between each single uh, point. And together, uh, this will then show you possible patterns and, and changes over time. Uh, this is the type of plot that is that, that we use on the dashboards. Uh, most of the uh, most of the visualizations on dashboards are time series plots because we're interested in uh, seeing how like the metrics change over time, and also like as before. The way to read this is to 
look at y-axis and uh, look at the values there and also you know check to make sure that the uh, y-axis hasn't been transformed in any particular way uh, another thing you might encounter is the stacked area plot and it's to visualize multiple amounts and proportions uh, over time uh, here is a uh, stacked area plot of age distribution uh, of the population in the United States from 1900 to 2002. Uh, so already we can see uh, on the left that population overall has increased, and uh, different like group, different categories uh, of ages um, have undergone different patterns. So, uh, for example, over time, we we see that the number of people uh, who are older than 64 years old has increased um, in terms of the proportion of the population. And, and then the uh, plot on the right allows you to compare the proportions. So while the plot on the left allows you to compare amounts, uh, the plot on the right allows you to compare like relative proportions. Uh, for example, uh, people who are between 5 and 14 years old uh, account for a slightly smaller proportion now than they were uh, at the beginning of this data set in 1900. Uh, a type that is, so this is a less common uh, type of plot, it is a mosaic plot. It's a way to visualize proportions in two or more categorical variables. When you first encounter it, uh, this may be a, a, like a little bit hard to to um, to like read and interpret, uh, but uh, I'm gonna as it was for me like when I first encountered this, this was um, there's just like a lot of things going on. But my hope is to, to teach you the tools to uh, read this and interpret this. Uh, so you're looking at uh, sizes of the boxes essentially, and and comparing how those sizes. Um, differ between the uh, different like subcategories. So for example, if we were to look at um, hair color in men and women in this data set, we can see that the uh, uh, box for the uh, black hair color and for males is, is uh, bigger than for um, females in this data set. And then the opposite is actually true for, for blonde. Uh, when we look at uh, differences or when we look at uh, proportion differences between hair color and eye color in the data set um, in this particular plot we've actually shaded according to standardized residuals what does that mean that means that we uh, calculated uh, unexpected proportion uh, based on like based on the uh, proportion of, of uh, like people who have black hair and people who have, for example, brown eyes. Um, and we compared the observed proportion with the expected proportion uh, and found that, hey, we, act, so the, the blue here is greater than four. Uh, like that's telling us that, oh, there are actually way more black haired people with brown eyes than we expected. Um, had those two had those two things been independent um red means negative so when we look at just the uh, the like number of people with blonde hair in this data set and then number of people with brown color in this data set uh brown eye color we actually see that they, we have way less uh blonde haired brown eyed people in this data set than we would have expected to see uh, had those things been independent uh, usually you don't see uh, a mosaic plot in this particular way. Like that's usually something that the um, that an analyst might include in their report or just in their exploratory data ana uh, analysis, uh, because this is how you initially um, can like form a hypothesis of oh hey these two things might have a a, a relationship between each other and uh, may not be independent. And at that point, you use a statistical test to figure out whether there actually is a like statistically meaningful relationship or not. 
okay, so let's actually take a look at like the ent the entire uh, three dimensional data set where we have uh, the uh, sex and uh, hair color and eye color. Uh, and let's just focus on uh, blue eye color, for example. Uh, so if we start going, you know, from left to right, uh, we see that okay, the uh, for for blue eyes, uh, we, we we have uh, for blue eyes and black hair, we have slightly more males than females, and then for uh, blue eyes and brown hair, we have uh, what looks like to be a lot more males than females. Uh, but then, if we were to look at blue eyes and then blonde hair, we have way more females than males. Uh, so you can use this to. Um, like compare proportions in in a multi-dimensional uh, data set. Uh, I, ch I specifically chose not to shade this according to like expectation versus uh, versus observed because that would have made this a lot harder to look at. Uh, but you can definitely also uh, apply that the particular like shading from the previous uh, mosaic plot over here. Any questions about mosaic plots? Okay, cool. Okay, uh, a survival curve, uh, which is something that we've been uh, using uh, occasionally in like different reports. Uh, this is mostly prevalent in like epidemiology and in like drug trials, uh, where you're interested in seeing how. Uh, the the time to a particular outcome uh like changes uh over time uh or not over time but like changes between groups for example uh so in this like session survival curve uh here we're looking at the wikipedia portal event logging data and uh specifically looking at like different languages uh, this is top 30 languages by volume of, of sessions um, notice that the x-axis is a time axis but then it has been log transformed uh, this is to make the uh, make the make the patterns a little bit easier to see because otherwise uh, everything would just be kind of scrunched up uh, in the um, like on the left and then we would have like a heavy tail on the uh, going right uh, so here we've actually uh, applied a transformation to the time axis, uh, and now we can look at how the proportions of, of sessions longer than a particular uh, time changes uh, between the groups. So going from left to right, uh, almost all, like um, uh, going across the, the languages, almost all of the sessions are longer than one second. Uh, and then at two, you know, we're starting to see uh, some drop drop off, and particularly at around ten seconds, um, if we were to look at the black, at the thick black line or thick black curve, uh, which is the which is a smooth median, um, like half of the sessions have dropped off around the ten second mark, uh, and then as we go, like as we go uh, further right, you know, we we see that. Uh, let's see here. That 80% 80, 80 of the sessions have dropped off, or specifically, like 20% of the sessions have remained uh, around the one minute mark. Uh, and then you can look at how the different curves vary. So uh, when you're like, let, like if we were to take a look at English, uh, like English sessions versus Russian sessions, uh, People, uh, people with Russian in their uh, preferred languages list, like as their most preferred language, they st like they stay on the portal uh, longer than English sessions. So this is how you would interpret this particular uh, graph. Uh, the survival curve uh, you may sometimes encounter it as a Kaplan-Meier curve. Uh, that's when you're uh, estimating the survival curve uh, using like a small data set but here because we have so much data uh, we were actually able to um, estimate the survival curve uh, using the data rather than using 
uh, like a particular statistic. Any questions about this one? This is the one that I think is like uh, one of the more complex ones to, to try like read and interpret. Okay. Uh, this is a heat map and it allows you to see wh which uh, particular observations have the highest or the lowest value across different variables. Uh, this is a heat map of um, performance in the NBA of the top 50 scorers. So you can uh, look at which, uh, which parts of the heat map have the, have like the most heat. Um, in this particular scenario, the, the scale is darker indicates more heat and then lighter indicates less heat. So if you're interested in, okay, who has the, you know, the most steals, uh, you would look at which row has the, the darkest, um, point for, for steals and you will see that it's Chris Paul. So this is for the 2008, 2009 season, um, heat maps, uh, there's a lot of uses for heat maps, uh, and, uh, and this is one of them. Any questions about heat maps? Okay. Uh, also, it's it's not necessary for the uh, for the feature like for the different attributes to be on the x axis and for the observations to be on the y axis. Um, those uh, in this particular case, those actually seem to be pretty interchangeable. Um, it depends on the dimensions of like where the heat map is going to be shown and how many observations versus how many features you have that you're trying to just uh, visualize. So, uh, you know, you may encounter, for example, uh, like a couple of uh, different like observations, but then a bunch of features. And if you're printing this on a piece of paper, then, or if the intended uh, format is a piece of paper, then it's going, you're going to have the uh, observations on the x-axis and then the uh, attributes on the y-axis. Uh, then we have a choropleth. Uh, you may have not known that this is the name for this type of uh, visualization. Uh, choropleth is a map uh, that is shaded according to a statistic or a variable. Um, so if you were to look at the... Um, uh, a previous analysis uh, that we've done, which is the uh, JavaScript, like with JavaScript support uh, and how that varies across the different countries in the world. Uh, I use the choropleth to show uh, which like which countries have uh, a greater share of, of JavaScript support than others. Uh, it's it's important to uh, look at the to, to look at the scale. Um, Sometimes authors will pick a really bad color palette to use, and it can be really hard to distinguish uh, lo like uh, low values from high values. Um, usually, they try to um, usually they try to have the same approach as they would with a heat map because uh, a choropleth is really just a heat map that is an actual map, and uh, and at that point you're kind of showing like where it's hotter and where it's colder. Then we have uh, different ways to visualize networks. Uh, so these are network graphs, graphs, um, because a, a graph actually has a mathematical meaning. Um, so there's, these are statistical graphs of graphs, uh, essentially. Uh, in this particular data set, we're looking at how um, like different news sources link and mention each other. Uh, and this is a way to uh, look at relationships between individuals. Uh, and there's different ways uh, to, to visualize those relationships. Um, on the left, we don't have a particular structure, uh, but on the in the middle, we have uh, imposed a circular structure to the network uh, so that we can see like where the links are maybe a little bit better. And then there's an arc diagram plot. Uh, and for the final one, 
I think I, yes, this is worth like 40 minutes in. Okay. Uh, for the final one, this is a radar chart, aka spider plot, aka spider chart, aka there's actually a bunch of different names for this thing. Uh, it's, this is probably the rarest one of the bunch uh, that I've introduced you to. Uh, this is a way to uh, compare just a couple of observations in, uh, in across like many different uh, attributes or metrics. So here I've decided to uh, look at the, the movies that I've seen pr uh, pretty recently and how those movies differ between each other in terms of uh, the writing quality, the acting quality, art direction, how rewatchable they are, how child friendly they are. Um, and so right off the bat, you can uh, get a quick overview that, hey, I thought really highly of Zootopia uh, and thought highly of X-Men Apocalypse, but in a particular way, but not other ways. Um, so this is uh, sometimes used in uh, when comparing like members of a sports team uh, or in psychology or in medicine where you have uh, like different metrics for uh, performance or maybe like health of a, of a patient. Um, so you can get a quick overview or like where they are at, where they're at um, as a whole. And that's the end of the presentation. I think I've covered like a huge majority of the of the statistical graphs that you'll encounter. Um, hopefully now you're better equipped to read and interpret uh, some of the more obscure ones. Cool. Uh, Trey, you're welcome. I'm glad you thought the presentation was great. Ha, ha, ha.